Hi, everyone. So my name is Nikita. I'm a founding ML engineer at Galileo. And today, um, as Sophia mentioned, I'll be talking about critical errors and ML data sets. And at the end, I'll, I'll demo how Galileo can fix them for you. So um, what is our, so our thesis is that model performance is an 80-20 problem. And what I mean by that is 20% of the performance gains come from tuning model architectures, loss functions, training schedules, et cetera, the stuff that um, machine learning practitioners have been pretty focused on for the last uh, few years, you know, as the industry has matured. Um, but 80% of it still comes from fixing the data. And this could be mislabels, class confusion, data imbalance, data drift. Uh, and these are things that we as practitioners haven't actually spent much time um, historically thinking about, um, which is kind of crazy because we think that it, it contributes the most to the eventual model's performance. Um, so yeah, today I'll be covering these data errors. Um, there's definitely more, but these are perhaps the largest categories as we see it. And at the end, I'll give a quick demo how Galileo can fix that. So what is mislabeled data? So essentially, this is when the given label doesn't equal the actual label. And what I mean by that, for example, is an, an image classification task um, where a labeler was given you know, a picture and they have to assign one of, let's say, like 20 categories to it. Um, here, for example, is the quick draw data set. On the left, the labeler was shown what looks to be a line, but they labeled it as a hexagon. And this is, these are all examples of errors in public data sets that are used for, for example, sketch recognition models. So on the second from the left, the circle was given the label of dog. You have a, um, a, what looks like a calendar given the label jail and a banana slash moon given the label of knife. Similarly in ImageNet, super popular, you know, canonical data set in computer vision. Um, rife with tons of different kinds of data errors. So on the left, um, it was given a label of kite, but looks very clearly to be a bald eagle, um, paper towel um, that should be dock. And we'll get back to this one a, a little bit more later, but um, it was labeled tow truck, whereas it looks to be a garbage truck, although it's hard to see because it's zoomed in. And then ant labeled as B or B labeled as ant. It's not only limited to computer vision. Also, NLP text classification has tons of these. For example, the convintent data set, where uh, your the like model is essentially given an utterance, and it has to predict the intent. So as you might imagine, like a voice assistant in your home. So booking a restaurant often was getting labeled as get weather, uh, and so on. Yeah. So why does mislabeled data happen? Um, part of it has to do with your labeling platform and um, essentially your budget at the end of the day, how many labelers get to review each sample and whether they're rotated to limit their bias. If you've ever tried to you know, label an entire data set or a decent chunk of it, you'll notice that, or at least we've noticed that over time, um, you start to develop very strict definitions in your head about how to label these. Um, that might not correspond with other labelers. So it's important um, for the labeling platform to not only rotate labelers uh, through the data set, but also have multiple labelers um, review each sample. Also, sometimes the task is difficult. So for example, um, perhaps there's some uh, domain knowledge that labelers might know. Maybe it's a healthcare data set and you ultimately need doctors to be the ones to label it. Um, also, sometimes there's uh, not a lot of room for error. Um, this might happen in scenarios where um, multiple labels might apply to the same example, um, things like that. So one other reason is that classes can also just be confusing. And we'll cover this more in the class overlap data error. So how does someone go about um, fixing these? There's actually been a decent amount of research and like work in the past few years. Um, so part of what we've been doing at Galileo and um, with other, other like research projects out there is um, making these algorithms easier to use and easier to um, put into your systems. 
Um, but the historical way is uh, just to start with making the labeler's life easier. So this could be more specific instructions for areas that you might expect them to struggle with or areas that you've like manually seen them struggle with. Um, it could be you know better labeling platforms, better tooling to um, you know help them uh, give more accurate labels. And uh, sometimes, yeah, choosing easier task types, whether that's making the domain easier, like for example, limiting the number of classes. Um, you know, in a lot of CV data sets, there's hundreds and hundreds of classes, and that can be pretty hard for labelers to efficiently choose. So yeah. looking at labeler agreement is a very common thing that the labeling platforms will hopefully automatically do for you. Um, you know, if there's a lot of disagreement on a label, um, you can then have that like further reviewed and sent to even more labelers, things like that. And finally, like I mentioned, there's been research in algorithmically detecting these. So that can come from few, lots of different ways of doing this, but it all basically comes from using the model's training signals to inform an algorithm which samples are mislabeled. <clears throat> so for example, you could look at the variance and the sample's loss over the epochs. Um, another very common method is to look at how certain the model is in the non-given class, as in if the labeler said it was dog, but the model very strongly thinks it's cat, um, that's a signal that indicates um, you know, perhaps the labeler was wrong. And finally, there's also a way of comparing to similar samples from the data set um, using the model's embeddings. And this can also indicate whether, you know, if all the samples that look just like this have a differing label, well, it's, there's likely some error. Um, yeah. So moving on to class overlap. Um, like if you remember that example from the quick draw data set where there was a banana or moon, um, yeah, sometimes things can just be difficult and labelers end up fighting over what the correct class is without any chance of success. So for example, going back to quick draw, um, here are a bunch of examples and you know you might have differing opinions on what constitutes uh, one class or the other, but it's pretty evident that um, no one's really set up for success in labeling these. So computer or laptop, well, those are kind of the same classes, but in quick draw, those are different. Uh, snake or snorkel, snorkel, in this case, this specific example could be the confused between the two, pizza or wheel, and squiggle or zigzag. Similarly, for ImageNet, there's a bunch of uh, dog breeds in here that can be very difficult to label if you're not um, you know, highly attuned to the differences between an otter hound, affin pincher, or briard. <laughs> um, and also, for example, on that uh, second from the right image, it's super zoomed in. So uh, all the ones that are zoomed in, like if you remember the tow truck versus garbage truck example, um, could just be difficult for somebody to label. And finally, on the rightmost image, cowboy boot or a cowboy hat, well, in this case, both would apply be, um, because the subject is wearing both of them. Um, but uh, in ImageNet, um, you would be restricted to only choosing one. So why does class overlap happen? Multiple classes can apply to the same label, like we saw with the cowboy boot, cowboy hat example. Um, also, the class definitions may overlap, especially when you have many, many classes. So for example, those dog breeds, um, so many of them that things can get a little fuzzy sometimes. And um, yeah, on the boundary groups of samples, and this is basically what we're, we call um, groups of samples that are very difficult for the model. So your class definitions may be fine. Maybe the dog breeds you know, are very set in stone. There's not really room for overlap. But when you have a zoomed in photo, then things get confusing. And you'll find these like groups of samples in your data set that are difficult because of some nature of the uh, input to the model. So how do you fix class overlap? Um, one way is to redefine the classes. Um, ultimately, it's a problem of class definition. So you can merge overlapping classes. Um, perhaps they're better off as one class. <clears throat> 
You can create, um, you know, or break apart class hierarchies. For example, in the laptop or computer, um, or in ImageNet, there's I think like maybe Dog and Husky, something like that, where one class is essentially a superset of the other one, and you're always going to get class issues between those two. So it'd be better to break them apart and recognize that they belong in separate hierarchies. Uh, and sometimes it makes sense to create new classes. For example, sometimes uh, a lot of the data sets have just garbage samples or things that don't relate to the task, and perhaps they would be better suited for a none category instead of giving just some like random category to them. And we'll see that um, later in the demo. Also, um, you could migrate to a multi-label classification task. So this is especially the case when multiple classes might apply to one um, image or you know whatever. And in this case, you would allow the model the flexibility to choose multiple classes um, or to decide not to choose a class. And besides the multi-label classification, um, for example, in image classification, you could also move to object detection. And, and that's perhaps why um, object detection has been so popular, is that um, the model can choose to label you know, n number of these objects um, or none at all. Finally, um, yeah, you can provide more nuanced labeling instructions. And this might just have to happen anyways. Um, because as uh, typically folks comb through their data errors, they discover you know, areas that they didn't expect at first um, that are giving the labelers difficulty. So perhaps you have to explain you know, what exactly a garbage truck looks like and what key features uh, to look out for that would differentiate it from a tow truck. The third data error cover is data imbalance. And I think this one is actually perhaps the most interesting one because of how little attention it gets in the academia. Um, you know, we're all pretty used to um, learning about class imbalance if you've taken machine learning classes, and that's when uh, labels, um, there can be a large imbalance in your samples um, when you break it down by the ground truth label, um, which can you know, give the model difficulty in learning a kind of niche label. Um, what doesn't get talked about, and perhaps is just because we haven't um, had the frame of mind or the toolkit to analyze this previously, is data imbalance. So this would be scenarios where you have some data where there's a lot of duplicates and maybe other data where there are very few examples of it. And of course, the model is going to overweight essentially to the data it sees. Um, the problem, though, is that often the data you have is um, perhaps easier anecdotally versus the data you actually need. So um, the data you need, the stuff you don't have much of, uh, also tends to be those examples that are the hardest anyways for somebody to disambiguate. Um, yeah. So for example, duplicates. Um, in all of the data sets we've looked at, there have been tons of duplicates. Um, super classic, you know, public ones, um, ImageNet. Um, I think I don't remember which one this was, but um, you know, 0.5% of this data set was just thank you without any differences. Um, and they don't have to be exact duplicates either, um, especially in images, uh, just small, you know, rotations or um, essentially not even uh, image augmentations, but um, yeah, some other kinds of very minor changes to it. Um, will essentially look like duplicates to the model. And, um, and if, if you're unconscious of this, it's essentially like you unconsciously were reweighting the loss to focus on specific scenarios. Um, but consciously, this could be a desirable thing to do um, instead of loss reweighting. Outliers, for example, are also kind of the opposite of duplicates. Um, these are, you know, typically edge cases, things that um, are indicative of the model's behavior in production on kind of undefined regions. Um, for example, these are outliers in IMDb Wiki, which is a data set of faces. Um, the chair has really nothing to do with the data set. And uh, while the image on the left is maybe similar, it's, you know, mostly grayed out. So, um, you know, there's basically some choice you have to make and really pay attention to here because this could be either an example of what 
where the model would fail in production um, or uh, something that is throwing off its um, training because it has nothing to do with the rest of the data. And finally, kind of in the middle between duplicates and outliers are underrepresented samples. So on the right, this is uh, a cluster uh, or like clustering of the similar data in the emotions data set. And so these clusters are semantically similar groups of samples where the larger clusters might um, indicate that there are more samples of this like variety in the data set. And um, yeah, so essentially too much of any one cluster there would skew the model's training and predictions to uh, focus on that region. So um, like I mentioned earlier, anecdotally, the easiest samples are often also the most common, especially in industry data sets in come production time. Um, that's just an anecdotal observation, but does indicate that um, you should consider uh, rebalancing your data set or downsizing it, you know, um, to avoid the model's um, behavior being biased. So how does one fix data imbalance? Um, really, the first step is figuring out a way to represent the data. And because once you have a good representation of it, hopefully that representation helps you discover these patterns where um, some regions are more um, common than others. Traditionally, this would look like perhaps, um, you know, maybe features and st statistical features on the data. For example, uh, image histograms or, you know, word frequency count vectors, you know, the n-grams, things like that. Um, these were kind of more historical ways to um, categorize your data in a way that you could then look for distributional differences. Um, these days, what's pretty neat is that with the large CV LLM models, we can get pretty powerful contextual embeddings for the data, which kind of opens up a whole new field of ways of um, organizing and, and showcasing insights in the data. So for example, similarity search for duplicates, um, you can you know, take a sample and look for embeddings that are similar to it. And, and those will be, um, you know, that, that's a great way of finding duplicates. The, you can perform the opposite, so anomaly detection to find outliers. And general clustering on the embedding space um, can help you find these regions that you can then rank by like size and impact on the model's performance. Um, so that gives you the regions that are you know, underrepresented or um, yeah, most contributing to the model's performance decrease. And, you know, an interesting thing, um, so you detect these, you know, an interesting way to get more uh, data in a region, and there's like several ways, but um, using those same embeddings, you could then find similar data from uh, other splits or other data sets you might have access to. Perhaps, you know, you have a stream of production data and you're not sure what to label from it. Well, one um, way that you could decide is to use the embeddings to find similar samples to the most, um, you know, maybe difficult for the model in training or the most anomalous um, um, examples. And yeah, essentially um, collate more examples of this uh, sample from other data sets. The last data error I'll cover is called data drift. And essentially, um, you know, a lot of different definitions about data drift. Um, for this case, I'll categorize it as uh, drift is the difference between two different data distributions. So that could be either two different data sets or different splits in the same data set. Um, but essentially, you're looking for a scenario where um, you might want, maybe you don't, the, the data in two um, places to look similar, and for some reason it doesn't. And this is an example of like a real um, data set where that island at the top um, didn't exist in the uh, split on the left. So yeah, this can happen over time. Um, we saw this a lot with COVID and for example, face recognition where all of a sudden all of the production data that these facial recognition models were seeing had masks involved and you know it totally broke them. This wasn't, this was, you could categorize as like a shift over time. Um, yeah, and COVID in other ways also affected, for example, NLP models with 
this new term that they had to um, you know, account for COVID-19. This can also happen between different um, data set splits. Uh, for example, so not necessarily just over time, um, but in a given um, training environment, you could have you know, a difference between the training and validation splits, and that um, you could call a generalization. So the generalization data gap. So that could be an example of um, a gap between your understanding of how the model is going to generalize to actual real world data, data it hasn't, you know, out of distribution data, data it hasn't seen. Um, the difference between validation and testing, that could be called an evaluation data gap because that's essentially the gap between what you think, you know, are good metrics maybe on the validation data, but then if testing is similar to your production, um, there could be, the gap could be indicative of undefined behavior when it comes to actual production time. Um, and sometimes, you know, for our customers, they also see these gaps between different data sets that they use, uh, that they take in from customers and uh, fine tune their models on. So these are essentially like the, the kind of gaps they need to address to be able to generalize their ML models across multiple scenarios. How does one fix data drift? Um, production model monitoring can give you an estimate of when the model's performance is degrading. So um, when that happens, you can send some of that production data to be labeled and then reevaluate your model's performance on it. Um, see whether those models predictions lined up with the overall like F1 and performances you're expecting. Um, you can also monitor changes in the model's prediction distributions. So perhaps it started to, you know, its confidence in this class has decreased dramatically um, from when it was trained on it. Um, and that could be an, a, an early sign that something is happening in the data. Also, there's different ways to actually compare the data itself. So one way more historically would be value-based distribution differences. You know, um, also this especially like comes up in structured data. If you have columns that you expect to be within certain parameters, then as they um, you know, drift, you, you'd be able to actually notice it. Um, this is harder to do in unstructured scenarios. And that's where embeddings really can come in and be helpful because the embeddings give you a way to um, to just look for new clusters that are appearing or ways that islands are like moving across um, space. And ultimately, it boils down to finding that data difference and adding it to some corresponding data set. Um, if data drift is a difference between two data sets, then ultimately how we're fixing it is by you know making them um, bring them to parity. So to recap, we've covered mislabeled data, class overlap, data imbalance, data drift. There are definitely more data errors. Some of these also, some of the data errors also fall within these. But um, yeah, it's been kind of surprising that I don't think yet there's been too much, um, for example, like academic classes on the subject. Although um, you know our thesis is that it's perhaps one of the most prominent um, impacts to your model's performance. Um, but hopefully, you know, that changes soon. There's definitely been a lot of interest from the research field in this. So, yeah, if you want to fix these and more instantly with state-of-the-art techniques, then come try out Galileo. It's available today for free, super easy to sign up and get started with. And I'll just give a quick demo of, for example, some of the things you might find in a data set. Um, so jumping over, so this is our website. You can sign up for free and get started up here. Um, we also have links to notebooks that show how we integrate with the different uh, model frameworks that you have. And for now, um, we just support different um, NLP task types. Going over to what you'll see, this is the news groups data set. It's one of the ones we provide as an example when you sign up. And um, sorry yeah. to interrupt, um, but we have five minutes left. So just to make sure we're watching the time. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so you'll see basically um, on the right is an insights chart where there are di the different um, bar plots that you might expect to normally see um, when you're doing, say, a text classification problem. 
And this might indicate to you, for example, like, hey, this particular class has a much lower F1. Um, correspondingly, the number of samples in this class are lower. So, you know, a quick fix here would be to add more samples of this task type. Um, yeah, different like insights that you might expect to see normally. Um, some of the data errors we provide out of the box, for example, is this likely mislabeled tab. Um, you'll see that a lot of these um, are, for example, this one on the left um, talks about baseball and um, the ground truth was like medicine, but the prediction and the what the model is suggesting is that it should be baseball. Um, similarly down here, should be space. Um, this one talks about guns, um, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, then I'll also showcase, so I mentioned a lot embeddings and how powerful they can be. And so let me go to the embeddings tab and you'll see this like cartographic representation of your data. And so what that means is all the data in the data set is spread out here as your model is seeing it. And so when these classes are far apart from each other, that's because the model you know, has um, def defined them very well. Um, but versus other uh, examples where things get very confusing, like for exa example, down here, these are classes that have to do with religion and all and often the difference between like an atheism versus a Christian versus um, just the miss category can be pretty confusing. Um, the last thing I'll showcase is, you know, you might've noticed this region standing out here that has uh, all the multicolored points in it. And, you know, that might be confusing because um, why would the model get confused on a bunch of data points that have totally different labels? Um, well, these are all the samples that are empty. And so that, for example, immediately jumps out um, as being confusing for the model. And so if I go ahead and select this region, you'll see the insights update and that this is uh, a region where the F1 is super low, much lower than our overall F1. If I wanted to get performance gains, I would you know, maybe change the class here. Um, essentially, this is an example of class overlap where these samples are, um, there's not a clear a class definition for samples that are empty. And yeah, so maybe I'll change that label or inform the labelers about what to do. Finally, I just want to show how easy it is to get started with Galileo. Um, you can today install Galileo, so install it through our um, data quality library. And um, we have this handy method now called dq.auto, where essentially you provide your data set and um, we will run and train um, an off-the-shelf hugging face model behind the scenes for you and um, you know, essentially um, give you those out outputs of it um, automatically in the Galileo console. And why that might be so great is, you know, as our thesis is, you can keep the model static, um, just change the data, and see all the performance benefits. Um, don't worry about you know, the specifics of the architecture or the hyperparameters hyperparameters, et cetera. So yeah, this is a very quick way to get started and see your um, data insights. And that's all I have. Thank you.